All right, good job, ladies. First Corinthians tonight, chapter number three. First Corinthians, chapter number three, and we look forward to the Bible study tonight and what the Lord has for us. And uh, busy time. Uh, looking forward to the next uh, several weeks and months uh, leading into 2020. A lot of exciting things are going on, and more uh, are going to happen on a weekly basis. And so, just continue to pray, make yourself available. Uh, for the Lord to work in your life. And let's look what the Bible has for us tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I'm going to read the first nine verses. Uh, then we'll have a word of prayer. Keep your Bibles open. We will turn to several passages tonight. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, beginning reading in verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Those are three words. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God, <clears throat> ye are God's husbandry, year God's building. We're going to look at a few things in this passage of scripture. I want to teach tonight on this subject. Uh, The title tonight is actually a statement that we're going to uh, build on, make a point in the introduction that we're going to build on this. And what I'm going to teach on tonight is, is entitled this, to properly labor for him. We're supposed to labor for Christ, aren't we? To properly labor for him you must depend on him. To properly labor for him, you must depend on him. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, I pray that as we get into the word of God tonight, may our attention be focused on what you have for us. Uh, Father, may we uh, allow the word of God to speak to us and work in us. May we uh, yield to the Holy Spirit of God uh, this evening. May the Bible study help us uh, to do more for you. Uh, May it help us to depend on you in a greater way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number 9, we see the statement, uh, For we are laborers together with God. This is a great passage of Scripture. And uh, every passage of Scripture, of course, is a wonderful passage of Scripture. But much that we can learn uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Without a doubt, uh, there is... Uh, There are carnal Christians, without a doubt. Uh, There were some strife and envying and divisions among the the, the people of God. And then Paul is writing here in a wonderful passage of Scripture. For for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I'm reading again verse 4, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. We give the labor, God gives the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now who does the work? God does the work. So how do we get our reward? Based on our labor. We labor for God. We are supposed to work for God. The word of God never tells us that the results are up to us. The word of God just instructs us to labor for him. We labor for God. And in doing so, we are laboring with God. Because in order for God to do the work, he wants us to put forth the labor. Verse 9 reminds us of that. For we are laborers together with God. God is the Almighty. He is not limited by anything or anyone. 
He has the power, but he has chosen to use you and I to labor for him. We can get our own reward uh, using the, the words of Scripture by our labor. So we labor for God, and in doing so, we labor with God because uh, we cannot bring about the result. God brings about the result. So we must work for him in order for God to give the result. But, but in order to get the result, we labor with him. Let me make this statement, and then I'll give you an illustration to illustrate it. We labor for God while depending on God to do the work. For example, we go to win souls while we are powerless to win a soul. And we get in here on Saturday morning, let's go soul winning. We're going to go win some souls. There ain't no man ever won a soul. We know what we mean by that. Let's go labor. And it's labor winning somebody to Christ, especially knocking on doors in Florida in the summertime. Uh, it's labor. It's work. We say, let's go win a soul, but <clears throat> we're powerless to win a soul. But we have to put forth the labor so that God will do the work. But yet week after week, souls are won. Uh, it's not you nor I that put somebody under conviction, that, can, that, that challenges and, and convicts the heart. No, it's the work of God. He is bringing about a result of our labor. So therefore, we labor for God, but in order for the work to be done, we have to have God do the work. If we go, and this isn't really what the Bible says about tonight, but if we go in our own flesh, our own ability, our own, our own means, our own way of going about it, get outside of Scripture, God does not bless that. We have to have God involved. We can put forth as a church a great production on Sunday. We can bring in the music that would entice the world, the atmosphere that would entice the world, and then be very, very careful in how we articulate what comes from the platform, the pulpit, so as not to make anybody upset or to put any pressure on people, uh, and there could be no conversions. Because God's the one that has to do the work. So it just makes sense that you and I ought to follow and labor, as he says, the labor. We labor for God. There's a lot of people in this world who are who 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 go and they do they work hard, but they're not laboring with God. They're laboring for themselves. So we labor for God, and in doing so, we labor with God. We are committed using that same illustration. We go to win souls while we are powerless to win a soul. We are committed to go and tell. That's the labor. But we depend on him to give the results. Laboring with him, don't miss this. We, have this. we have this foundation that we see in our text that you and I, we're familiar with this. We, we, one man plants, one man waters, one man reaps. We enjoy it when we can plant, water, and reap. But that's usually not how it goes. So we're all in this together just laboring for God. And letting God do the work so we labor for him, we labor with him. So laboring with him enables us to depend on him. Think with me just for a moment. I know it's Wednesday evening. You've already put forth three days of work this week. You probably haven't had supper or, or maybe you had something you didn't like for supper. I don't know. Give me, give me your attention. Just think with me. We labor for God. And in doing so, we labor with him because we are doing what he wants us to do in our labor so that the work can come about, so the fruit comes about. So the more we labor for him, the more we have to depend on him because we do not want our labor to be in vain. How foolish would it be for us to work and work and work and work and give up our extra day of the week, give up extra time of the week to do a work for him, to try, try and reach people with the gospel and leave God out of it, not depend on him and labor and labor, but he, it's up to him for the results. So the, the more we laboring with him enables us to depend on him because we need him for the result. Likewise, the more we depend 
on him, the more we are able to do with him. So, we're to labor for Christ. But it's not us that does the work. We put, we put forth the sweat. We put forth the effort. God says, go, we go. He says, labor, we labor. He, he says, do a work for me, work. While you can still do a work, we're supposed to work reaching the world with the gospel. But we can't save a soul. We, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't do a miraculous work in, in, in a home. It takes God. But it takes us bringing the message, laboring for Him, so that we labor with Him, and God brings about the result. Makes us feel good about our labor when God gets in it, doesn't it? So, we labor for Him while depending on Him to do the work. So, laboring with Him enables us to depend on Him. Because why am I going to go out soul winning when I can't convert a soul? Why would I do that without depending on him to go with me? Without depending on him to do the work? Likewise, don't miss this. The more we depend on him, the more we are able to do with him. It's logical. Precept upon precept. If he does the work, we, the more we depend on him, the more we can do with him. There are Christians that have more fruit in their labor if they depended more on God in their daily life. And likewise, the more we depend on God, the more we can do for him in our labor. That's why it's important for every child of God to labor for him. We labor in prayer. We labor in some uh, area of service at the church. We labor in reaching the lost with the gospel. God then, because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the soul, the Holy Spirit does the convicting, we put forth the labor, we depend on God for the winning of the soul. Uh, I, I, you, you, let me use the pastor as illustration. I labor in a message. I labor in prayer. When I get up to preach the message, I cannot do anything in the heart of the men sitting in front of me. That takes God. So I need to put forth the labor so that God will bless it. Are you with me? Then God does the work. That's why we as Christians need to put forth the labor then God does the work, and the more we labor, that's why every child of God ought to, ought to labor for Him. Because that puts us in a position where we have to depend on Him. And the more we depend on Him, the, the more we are able to do with Him. The word carnal is used in this passage of Scripture. Because it became all about the flesh. It became about men. It became about personality when it's all about him. That's why, as a Sunday school teacher, we shouldn't teach in the flesh. If we sing, we shouldn't sing in the flesh. We go out and witness. I'm, I'm think many have great personalities. They could talk to a brick wall. You ought to use that personality, but that personality is not winning anybody to Christ. Likewise, I've seen some of the best soul winners who have a hard time carrying on a conversation with people they've known their whole life. But yet, they're a great soul winner. Is it their personality? Is it their talent? No, it's, it's dependence on God. Now, let's move from establishing this. We lay, To properly labor for Him, you must depend on Him. As a church, collectively, the more we want to do for, for God, the more we must depend on God. You as a Christian, the more you want to do for God, the more you must depend on God for it to be done. A result of that is the more you depend on him, the more you're able to do with him. That's why some Christians, as they grow, they end up doing more for God than they ever thought they could do. Because when they started, they had an opportunity, and it was, well, I'm really going to have to depend on God to get this lesson down. I'm going to really, I'm going to really, oh, I'm going to have to really depend on God to do this. And the more they depend on God, the more God works with them in their labor. 
And so it becomes, they become dependent on each other. Laboring with enables us to depend on. And the more we depend on him, the more we are able to do with him. Now, I want to take that and now I want to get into the outline. That's just the simple, brief introduction. I want to use the outline tonight and I want to give you seven ways that we can depend on God that are revealed in the life of Paul. I want to take the life of Paul and I want to point out seven different ways that you and I can depend on God that scripture reveals in the life of Paul where he depended on God. Uh, Because we want to labor with God to do a work for God. And the more I do for God, the more I have to depend on him to do it. A byproduct of that is a very good thing. I have to depend, the more I depend on him, the more I'm enabled to do with him because it all depends on him anyway. Let me give you the first one. Turn to the book of Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. And then when you get there, uh, we're going to turn from there to a couple other places, but we're going to come back to Acts chapter number 20. So you may want to put something there to get back there quickly. Acts chapter number 20. And the first thing I want to point out uh, that we can emulate in our own life where Paul uh, depended on God as it was revealed in his life, it was his, his habit of life. That's number one, his habit of life. We see it many places in the New Testament, but I'll point out two. One here in Acts chapter number 20 in verse number 36. Uh, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. If we go back to verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul is given some instructions in Acts chapter, Acts chapter number 20. And then when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. This is just one example of him going to, to, to God in prayer. Chapter 21 should be on your same page there, verse 5. And when he accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Uh, something I'll point out very, very quickly, and you may want to go back and study it out yourself. Uh, we went through the book of Acts in a year, went through the, 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 the entire book of Acts. Something that blends in because you're not looking for it because there's so much in the book of Acts. But when you start looking for it, here's two examples, and there's many, many more that just kind of blend into the story of Scripture of how many times Paul stops to pray, how many times he stops to pray. It was a habit of his. When, there was, when he gave instruction, they prayed together. When they had needs, they prayed together. When he needed power, he prayed to God. When he was in a bond, he prayed. It was a habit of his life. Christians who don't pray, and I'm trying to help you tonight. Christians who don't pray don't depend on God. You're depending on yourself. If you truly believe that you weren't enough, you, you depend on God. We're all guilty to some degree of depending on us when we should depend on God. And when we labor, sometimes it puts the pressure on us. That's why it's coming soon. We'll get back in the habit of all the different ministries, Sunday school, all the different outreach ministries. I need you to fill this spot. Pastor, I don't think I can. Well, you're going to have to really work. I'm going to have to really depend on God to do that. That's not a bad place for you to be in. And so I got to depend on him. Now he can labor with you. He can do the work with you. And what you'll find out is the more that you do that work, the more you're going to... But it's going to have to be a habit of prayer. It was, this was an evidence of Paul's dependence on God. It was the habit of his life. It was the secret behind his labors. We have a lot of habits, don't we? Some we call good habits. Some we call... Or most we call bad habits. Is prayer a habit? Is it, what is a habit? You don't even have to think about it. You just do it. Can you imagine if every child of God, prayer became such a habit? The moment they had a need, it was just, it was just reflex to bow their head. The moment that there was a blessing, it was reflex. They just stopped and bowed their head. I had to give thanks to God. That's a habit. 
But that was evidence of his dependence on God. Is there any, this is just one of the reasons, certainly, but a main reason why Paul was used in such a great way. Because he had that habit. That shows his dependence on God. Number two, turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And everywhere we turn is going to be right here in the New Testament because we're dealing with the life of Paul. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. We find his continued abode. His continued abode. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We find in verse 16 and 17, we find Paul in a situation that he found himself in more than one time. At my first answer, no man stood with me. 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. All men forsook me. Then look at his response in verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that my me, the preaching, might be fully known and all that the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. He, put, he gives us a comparison. But all men forsook me. In too, the life of too many Christians, when man forsakes, they quit. Because... Even as a Christian, they are living to man's approval. We can go back to our text. One saying there of Paul, one saying there of Apollos. Well, it's man's approval. You know, I came from Paul, I came from Apollos. That's it. That's man's approval. But he said, all men forsook me. But God's presence was enough to sustain him. He had become so independent of man that he was just totally dependent on God. Now, we know the scripture well enough to know he wasn't a hermit. He wasn't antisocial. But he did not depend, he, 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 he abided in the presence of God. A lot of times when, and I'll use the terminology of scripture, men forsake us, we're so unaware of the presence of God that we don't realize that he's standing with us, that he's never left us. Because we become so dependent, listen to me, so dependent on men I thank God, and he lists friends in the same passage. Thank God for every person. And Paul was also dependent on men, by the way. Read, read the book of Acts. But when there, when there came a point when all men forsook him, in that particular situation, God stood with him, and he recognized that God's presence was what he lived for. Uh, a lot of times we as Christians don't find out God is enough because we never put ourselves in a situation where God is all we have. Because we just continue to depend on ourselves and depend on other people. God's presence was Paul's joy and sorrow. It was his, the presence was his peace and his persecution. It was the power of his testimony. It was his courage and his conflict. It was his comfort in a trial. It was his supply and service. It was his consolation and loneliness. The presence of God. His continue. Well, if I don't have anybody else, I have God. Is that not dependence on God? If we can continue and all we have is God, we, God might work with us. We might be able to do something with him because we're just focused on his presence. We're just focused on the fact that he is with us. And unfortunately, men do forsake us. Unfortunately, men do fall by the wayside. In this list here, in this greeting, uh, Demas has mentioned, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. It is a reality. But if everybody leaves you, is the presence of God enough? We can labor if God's presence is there. Number three, we find uh, in Colossians chapter number one, and I'll have to start moving quicker. Colossians chapter number one. And we'll look at verse number 25. We find his energy. I read the book of Acts and just reading all that Paul does, I get tired. Uh, he did a lot for the Lord. But he was flesh and he had a thorn in the flesh, the limitation. But what was his energy? Found in Colossians 1 verse 29. Where unto I also labor. There's that word labor. Striving according to his working. Which worketh in me mightily. His energy, the power of God. 
He had the power of God. It came from the, the, the it came from a prayer life. It came from continuing to, to abide in his presence. That was the energy he had. Paul didn't depend on Red Bull to keep him going. You know, I have, I'm going to split the church right here. He didn't have to have a pot of coffee to keep him going. I know we drink it because we like the taste. That's why we drink it. But he had the power of God. He had the power of God. I'm not preaching against coffee. Uh, God's power was what propelled him, not Paul's preaching. I don't know how Paul preached, but there's evidence of the power of God. See, what is, what is it that's going to keep us going as a, as a Christian? It's the power of God. You, you, you read of the testings, you read of the imprisonments, you read of the beatings, you read of the, that forsaken. What would keep him going? It certainly wasn't man's approval. It certainly wasn't pat on the back. It was the power of God. That was the thing that propelled him was his power, God's power, not his ability. Too many Christians are depending on their ability. And that's why they're limited in what they can accomplish for God. If you don't have the ability to do something, but yet you feel impressed by God to do that, which you don't think you have the ability to do, uh, you just do what God wants you to do. And the power of God can sustain you. The power of God can propel you. Because remember, all we're responsible for is the labor but too many Christians, too many Christians, if one Christian does this, it's too many. But too many Christians put all their focus on how am I going to get the result. Let me just give a little side note here. Parents, we all, all parents are still in their children. You want your children to turn out for God. You can't control that. All you can control is the labor that you put in while you're rearing them. God has to do the work in their heart. But a lot of times we focus on the end. We want the work that only God can do, and we neglect that which we're supposed to do. Too, too many, and, and, and I'm just gonna go, I'm, it needs to be said, too, there's too many churches and too many preachers and too many Christians today that, that they are just praying for revival, praying for revival, praying for revival. I say, Pastor, are you preaching as praying for revival? But yet, they never leave the church and go knock on the door when anybody the Christ. They never take a stand for that which is right. But they're just praying for God to do the result without the labor. That's why as a church we have a responsibility. We will not only send out foreign missionaries, we want to support them, but that, that doesn't excuse, we can't hire our soul winners. We have to labor. It's the power of God that comes with that. We must have that. Uh, number four, 2 Corinthians chapter number five. 2 Corinthians chapter number five. In verse 14, we find his motive. Remember, these, these are areas of his life where it reveals his dependence on God. It's often been said, I've said it, and you've probably heard somebody else say it. God did a great, I don't know anybody, that God did a greater work through than the Apostle Paul. Spreading the gospel, churches to the Gentiles, we have, we, we have been affected by the Apostle Paul. He, according to scripture, he had to depend on God in a great, great way. And the more he depended on him, the more God would work with him. We find his motive, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The love of Christ constraineth. That, that very simply, I don't have time to really expound on it a lot. That word constraineth simply means power enough to produce the effect. We, we talk about the, the mercy of God, and we should. All of us deserve to pay for our sins. It's the mercy of God. We talk about the grace of God, and we should. Where would we be without the grace of God? But the love of God. It's because of the love of God He grants mercy. It's because of the love of God that He gives grace. And, and I think we should talk about 
and rejoice in the byproducts of His love, but where would we be without the love of Christ? We'd be on our way to, to a devil's hell. How can not, that not become a motive? It constrains us. It, 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 it is power enough to produce the effect. That's his motive, number five. Back to Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. In verse number 27. Actually, it's verse 20. I don't know what verse it is. It's, we'll start from verse, oh, I'm in, no wonder, I'm in verse chapter 16. I'm like, this, this doesn't sound right. Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 27. No, that's not right either. Oh, that's uh, chapter 19. Okay, now, here's chapter 20. All right. I was making sure y'all are paying attention. All right, Acts chapter 20, verse 27, like I said. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We see number five, this is a result, this is an evidence of dependence on him with his message. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What was always on the lips of the Apostle Paul? What has God said? The word of God. The word of God was his message. You know, our dependence on him is revealed when we go, we, we go from I think to God says. Too many Christians have conversations with themselves. That would be depressing in itself. And with other Christians. Well, I think. I think, and teenagers and young people have to be careful with the principle, but I think, what does God say? Well, pastor, this is what I think. I, I'm going to be as blunt as I can. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what God says. And when we live in a world created by what I think, Number one is a disaster waiting to happen. But we're not depending on God. I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. Well, God might have it all figured out already. Uh, it's not about what I think. What was his message? The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. Uh, our foundation. I call it our default position. A lot of times when I'm counting, they say, you got to have your default. What is it when the crisis comes? What do we always fall back on? What is it? We, uh, we all have different insecurities. We fall back to our insecurities. We fall back to the defense mechanism to defend ourselves. But what should we fall back to? Thus saith the Lord. When we live that way, it is revealing dependence on God. And we depend on God. Then he labors with us. And the result is, is, is up to him. And he, he does a work. But the message is a revealing of our dependence on him. How are we living? Are we living what God says or what we think? This is what I think. This is what I think. This is what I think. That's why there doesn't need to be a lot of committees, and there's not in this church. A lot of committees getting together, deciding what everybody thinks to do about this and this and this and this and this. God made it so simple for us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. God made it so simple for us. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the utmost parts of the earth. He made it so simple for us. We just need to do what God says. Well, I think, I think, and that's why I think one of the most important uh, Wednesday Night Bible series I've taught in, in, in the last several years is the one I taught on Bible principles. Bible principles for daily living. You need to get principles, and you need to get them in your life. Why? Because then you, you don't have to make decisions based off what you think or off what you feel. His message, I depend on God. In other words, it doesn't matter what I think because it just matters what God has said. Number six, 2 Corinthians again, and I believe it's chapter 12. It is, I know this one. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And we find the source of Paul's blessing here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9. And he said unto me, this was the answer after Paul has asked God on more than one occasion to remove the thorn from his flesh. And, verse 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We find the source of his blessing. I've preached several times on verse number 9, but another way of saying verse number 9 is God saying, depend on me. Now, was Paul limited in what God did through him? God did amazing works through Paul. Do you mean Paul had a physical infirmity and God did what he did? Do you mean Paul begged God on more than one occasion to take this thorn in my flesh away? Because it was, it was, it was difficult for him to live with. It was a hindrance to him. Certainly there was discomfort there. And in Paul's mind, could you imagine what I could do for God if I didn't have this thorn in the flesh? And another way of saying what God said in verse number 9 is depend on me. And when he had to depend on God more, because God refused to take away the thorn in the flesh, he depended on God more than he could labor with him in a greater way. There are a lot of Christians who could do even greater things for God. Your prayer life could be more powerful because you have a thorn in the flesh that God will not remove for you. So you have to depend on Him. There, there, are, there are Christians in, in many areas that they're more effective as a servant of God because they have to depend on God. What, what did... What, what did we say at the beginning? We labor for God. We labor with God. We labor for Him while depending on Him to do the work. He does the work. So if you have a thorn in the flesh, which means you have to depend more on Him than somebody else has to, you're depending on Him for the result anyway. So the more you depend on Him, the more He works with you because the result is His. And the more you laboring with him enables us to depend on him. So the more we depend on that's why, well, I just have this problem. I'm resigning. Now, you might have a physical, and I don't think I have to clarify this because I've been your pastor long enough, but I will anyway. You may have something that God has placed where you can't do something that you'd like to do for God. But that's typically not the situation. Well, I have this, but I can't. No, God may want you to depend on him more so that, you can labor with him more. This was his source of blessing. He had the ability by the grace of God. By the grace of God, he had the ability to persevere. That grace, that ability that God gave him to endure, God does that so that we have the power of God. How do we get the power of God? By depending on Him. By count, say, God, I can't do it. You're going to have to do it. Well, God's been doing it all along anyway. God's the one that does it anyway. I'll give the example of a Sunday school teacher. Teaches the faithfully that class and the health change or something comes in. We'll just call it the thorn in the flesh. And I can't, I can't do it. I can't go, I can't, I'm limited now. God, you're just going to have to do it. Well, who do you think was doing it before? Any eternal result, he was doing it anyway. So now we have to depend on him in a greater way, and it enables him to do more. Number seven, book of Galatians, last one. Should be just a couple pages of Galatians, chapter number one. Last two verses of the chapter, verse 23 and 24. We have already seen, and I'll review very quickly and we'll be done. We've already seen these revelations of Paul's dependence on God his habit of life, his continued abode, his energy, his motive, his message, the source of his blessing, and now we find his motivation. But they had heard only 
Galatians 1, verse 23, they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which, which once he destroyed. This is Paul's testimony. The, 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 they're hearing that the very one who persecuted the church, who persecuted those who believe by faith, he's now preaching and he's now propagating that which he once destroyed. Think about that. Verse 24, and they glorify God in me. That was his motivation, to glorify God. You, th you think about that. The one who persecuted the church, the one who destroyed churches, who killed Christians, who arrested Christians after his salvation is now preaching with the power that Paul preached with, is now starting churches, is now winning people to Christ, is now hitting the pagan religion head on. He's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the theologians. The power of God is evident. The power of God is real. And, and, and everybody, and now the people who hear about it, what can they say? Well, only God could do that. That was his motivation, to glorify God. Now, let me, let me help some of you, try and help some of you. You may not have the testimony that you wish you had. You may not have grew up in the way that you wish you had. You may not, you may not have had things that maybe your own children, opportunities your children have. But that doesn't mean God that can't get glory out of you. He can get glory out of all of us. Oh, only God can do that. That's why when you face an adversity, we as a church face an adversity. We haven't known all the reasons why we've wandered in the wilderness for the last several years. But I tell you what, God gets glory out of that. And we're not suffering. And God is blessing. Greater blessings are coming. God must be in that. Isn't that our, our desire? And, and, and many of you have faced things, you're facing things, you're going to face things you know nothing about. And it's an opportunity for God to get the glory in your life. Look at what they're doing. Look at what God's doing with them. Look at, well, can you believe what they're, I can't believe what, well, God has to be involved in that. That's all Paul cared about. And they glorified God in me. Oh, I'd love to do something for God. You have to depend on Him. Because one man planteth, one man watereth, they're the same. Only God gives the increase. Only God gives the fruit. We labor for Him because we're supposed to. And when we depend on Him, we must also depend on Him because we have to have Him to do the work. And the more I depend on Him, the more I can labor with Him. And as I labor with Him, in order for there to be fruit, I have to depend on Him. That's why when you go out and you come Saturday morning, say, I'm going to go knock on some doors, invite some people to church, that's why you better, you, you better have prepared yourself spiritually. Because God's got to do the work. If you hadn't talked to God all week, how was God going to use you? That's why you get up here and sing. Well, I, right before you get up here and sing, oh, God, help me to remember all of my words. If that's the only prayer you've prayed all week, you're not spiritually prepared for God to use that song to work into somebody's heart. Uh, we have to depend on Him for the work. The labor and the work. So again, to properly labor for him, you must depend on him. Our motivation should be, I just want to glorify God. I just want to glorify God. I just want to glorify God. In order for me to glorify God, I have to depend on him. An amazing thing, the more I depend on him, the more fruit can be seen in my life. The more fruit that is evident, the more he can do. So, 
eh, I've been on soul winning a little bit, so let me just end with this. Some of you have gone through that plan of salvation so many times. You can say it forwards, backwards in your sleep. It's not a negative thing. But do you depend on that and the number of times, the, every scenario you've seen, you, you, you've been chased by every breed of dog, you, you, you've done it. Are you depending on your experience and the number of times you've recited that plan of salvation? Or are you depending on God to do a supernatural work through you, through the word of God, and the heart of the person that you're talking to? We have to depend. That might freshen up our soul winning results. That's why, and I know there's young men here preparing to preach, pre, to preach, and it's true of every preacher. We can get in this Bible, we can study, we can depend on our memory, we can depend on an alliterated outline, we can depend on illustrations, we can depend on that, we can depend on, well, this is, you know, this is the type of message that I'm going to preach, and it, it's, it's structured in such a way that the people have to realize not only how smart I am, but they must realize that there's something that they need to do. No. Labor. And let God do the work. Literally, a preacher could walk up, and I shouldn't suggest this because you're going to say, well, Pastor, why don't you do it? And just say, Jesus wept, and if God's in it enough, God can do a work. No, I'm not doing that. You get the point. Let's all stand. Father, help us.